Good morning. Uh, today I will be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in love, we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in the grace of giving. Thank you, Esteban. Well, I've had a great morning. I got to teach kids about tabernacle, so <laughs> that was just cool. Uh, what a great thing to be able to worship God and to realize how much easier it is now with the things that we have and being able to worship Him. Lots of exciting things are happening. Uh, Joel and Ann Sumar are going to be here this week. Uh, I think on Tuesday they're getting in, and so if you're coming over Wednesday, you might get a chance. They'll still be here next Sunday. And so he's going to be speaking next Sunday, and so I'm excited to get to hear him and to get to meet them and uh, see how they're going to work here. It's going to be great to have him as, as part of our team here. Also, we're trying to collect for backpacks and for school supplies to fill teachers' bags. This is on giving. We could use some more. <laughs> There's a list in the bulletin. Uh, this is one of the great things that we're able to do that says a lot to our community. It says a lot to our schools around us. It says a lot to kids. And it's a way in which we get to be known in the community by what we give. And so giving is one of those things that everyone seems to realize happens in church. And a lot of times they realize it happens to them in church. And so even people who have never been in church whatsoever at all will come by. And I actually had a guy say, well, what do you think you're here for if it isn't to give me money? I said, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> I think we've got the wrong thing. But they understand about giving. They understand that there's some kind of giving supposed to take place. Not that kind is, you know, sure we help people, but there's a whole lot more to it than that. And so what I want to do is be able to talk to you a little bit about that today because if you don't learn how to do that grace, you're missing a huge part of what Christianity is all about. And so let's look at the passage that was read to us by Esteban today with some of the things that he says. Now what's going on here is there's been a famine in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where everything started, Pentecost, 3,000 baptized, the church grows, five, ten thousand, 10,000, possibly more there, and then it begins to spread out all over the world. Well, it gets so far away as the Macedonian countries, and these are Gentile people, and so they don't know anybody in Jerusalem. They don't have any relatives there because they're not Jewish. They're Gentile. In fact, there's some people there that don't like them so much. But Paul is, is trying to get to them. He says, you know what? I came and I shared the gospel and I came from there and they shared their faith with you. And so you share because they have a need. They're starving to death. And since they shared in order for me to come here, it's time for you to be able to share. And so he says, you need to send them some money. And it needs to be significant. Because people are starving. And this is your place. And this is what we do. And so he puts this burden on them. And I want you to listen to what he says about their response. They're right in the middle. They've got some together. They're going to be able to pick it up. He's got Titus coming to be able to do some things like that. And this is just one of those incredible things about how all of this happens. 
he talks about their extreme test of affliction. Well, that doesn't sound good. Their abundance of joy, their extreme poverty overflowed to a wealth of generosity. Now, you don't usually put all those things together and say your great poverty and great affliction is going to make, no, you're not going to get much there. No, it depends on who they are. And that's what he's really trying to get across is the type of people that these guys are is because extreme affliction and poverty, but with abundance of joy has, has brought about great generosity. And he says, it was according to your means and even beyond your means that you were able to give. You begged us for the favor of giving to the need of the other people. What a great thing it is to be able to see people respond like that. Have you ever wanted to give to a project? I mean, usually we get asked to give and asked to give and asked to give all the time where we're, you know, we feel like you know, everybody's trying to sell us something and, and trying to get money from us and, and church is just one more. And that's not the way it is at all. He says, you have a chance to show this gift of grace. Because that's really what it is, is a gift of grace. And so as he talks about this, he says it's the type of people that they had become. He says, first of all, you gave yourselves to the Lord. And then you gave yourself to the work and to me. And he says, wow, that's just amazing to look at how all that happens. Because they had done that first, then pocketbook is no problem. But if you haven't given yourself to the Lord, well, then pocketbook's going to be a problem. And especially if you haven't given yourself and understood that God wants some things done here on earth, not just for you to give yourself to him and say, okay, we're good, but that God is actually trying to do something here, that Jesus established churches, that this is where Paul talks about a church in need and give money. Is that specific? We talk about a whole lot of other things, and he says, this is what they need right now. How much do you have? And they say, not much. And he says, how much do you want to give? And they said, a lot. That's kind of impressive, isn't it? Because they understood the need. They understood what it's all about. It's about giving to God and, and helping his work continue and being able to save some people who have done so much to share with them. And he calls it an act of grace. He says, you excel in everything. You excel in faith and speech and knowledge and earnestness and love. He says, I want you to excel in one more. I want you to excel in giving. I don't know about you, but I've struggled with this over the years. And the idea of giving money sometimes is harder. Let me suggest to you why I think it's harder. Do you ever wish you were poor? I think it's a lot easier then because there's not that much expected. But if you've got enough to take care of yourself, and here's the theory that God says is, you know, God will bless you and give you enough to take care of yourself. Okay, I buy that. Yes, God did that and gave me enough to take care of myself. And then people come and say, and now we want you to give. Wait a minute. You're kind of being contradictory here because you said, yes, God would give me enough to take care of myself. And I'm doing that. He's given me a job, he's allowed me to work, and I'm able to do that, and then you say I'm supposed to give it away to somebody else? Yes. Okay. And we struggle with that. Because God gave you more than he wants you to live on. And we go, no, I think he gave me just enough. <laughs> you know, I think it was just about right. It's going to come out almost even here. And he says, no, I gave you more than what I wanted you to live on so that you would have some to share with other people. And we struggle with that kind of a concept because we think God was being generous and God says, I am. I'm being so generous that you can be generous. And that's hard for us to be able to handle. You know, if you've only got two pennies, 
how hard is it to give everything that you have? It doesn't seem that hard. Because you're really not going to expect the two pennies to do anything. They're not going to get you anywhere. They won't buy coffee or a Coke or anything. You realize there's not anything you can buy for two pennies? Put them in the collection plate. Goodness, what else are you going to do with them? Nobody else would take them. I might as well give them to God. There's something wrong with that kind of thinking. But it would almost be easier if we didn't have quite as much and didn't depend on quite as much. And so I think it's hard for the people in the middle. If we had a whole bunch, then it might be easier because we're still not touching into what we feel like God gave us to live on. But giving is a matter of faith. And it is what we believe. And we have a lot of work to do here. We're trying to do something with schools, and we've let you guys get in on that. We're hiring a couple of extra guys because we think we need that to make this church grow. To be able to fill the need that God has here at Mesa. To be able to make a difference in his body here so that we are able to able to fulfill the work that we see God has for us and so yeah they're going to be asking you to give because those guys need to be supported as well I think it comes this way it's how we see things and I think that's what happens to us how we see our resources first of all is survival Here's what I have to survive on. And if it's what I have to survive on, then I need to keep it, protect it, you know, be careful about it. Because after all, it's all I have to survive on. And when I'm in survival mode, then it's all about survival. I think war is kind of the same thing. You know, you manage resources because we're going to need that in order to win. And if you give anything at all, you're going to give so that you can win. But you're going to manage resources and protection is one of those big things that you're going to do so that you can protect what you have so that you're able to live. And I think this is where most of us live is in survival mode or protection mode because we don't want anybody messing with our stuff. After all, it's our stuff. We worked hard for it and it feels like God maybe is trying to get into our stuff because we don't really see everything as being his. So I think that's one of them. Pharisees were very much that way. They didn't want to see anyone getting into their area. And so they didn't want to give any credit to Jesus. No, we control it all. It's our stuff. It's our survival. It's where we live. And that's what makes all the difference. Second one, I think, is this evil outlook. And it says, I am just going to go and blow it and I'm going to take yours and blow it, and I'm going to spend everything that I can because I am just here to live it up, we all die young. I don't expect to make it till 30. I don't know how many times I heard that. Yeah, and most of them did, and then they regretted it and said, oh, what, did I, what was I thinking? But it's this evil outlook that things are here for me to use. What do you mean asking me for them? You give them to me. And their whole view of the world is everybody else ought to give to me so that I can use for my own pleasure, for my own outlook, for whatever I want. And that really is their outlook on things. And I think the last one perhaps is the good outlook. We don't see this one very often. It says, I believe in the middle of a sinful world that is full of corruption and evil around us that good is possible. And I am one of those people. And I will do good things in order to produce good. And that the good that I am going to do is is there for God. And that by doing something good, it changes me into the person I want to be. It does not matter how the world reacts. But by doing something good, it allows good to exist. Because if we don't do anything good, who will? Certainly not the guys in survival. Certainly not the guys with evil. It's only people who believe in something beyond what they read in the news. 
that says, I believe God is working, and I believe something is so much bigger here, and I'm willing to invest in good. I'm willing to invest and say, it changes me into someone good when I am able to give toward that. And church is the place. It's one of those where God recognizes, okay, I'm counting that. I mean, there's a whole lot of other things that get done in secret, and yes, God rewards those. And nobody looks at your thing in the plate when it goes by. But he definitely counts this. So if you want to know, how do I hand God money? Paul's telling you here, this is how you do it. This is how you hand God money. I think these are all something we struggle with in our idea of this. But I think God's trying to do something good. In Mark chapter 6, in verse 35, as he was training his disciples, he has already sent them out to preach. And they've come back and they found out that John the Baptist has been beheaded and most of them were John's disciples and so it's a pretty depressing time. And it says, and when they grew late, his disciples came and he said to him, this is a desolate place and the hour's now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. This is a training time. They're exhausted. They're emotionally exhausted. They're physically exhausted because they had to walk to all these places. And then they had to preach. And it may not look like it takes much energy up here, but it kind of does, especially if you thought of something to say before you walked up here. Hope, that's a good plan, by the way, if you ever get up here, is think of something first. And then Jesus turns around. They're just trying to be proactive about the whole thing. They see this huge crowd out here, and they see all these people, and they're going, well, you know, this is going to turn out bad. But if we plan all this well, then it'll be better. So let's send them home now before dinner time so that they can go, they can find something to eat. We're just considering them. And Jesus turns it completely around on us and says, no, you give. And they're like, us give? Yes, you give. And what's the first thing you always hear when you ask someone to give? I don't have enough money. And that's their statement. We don't have enough. It'd take 200 denarii to buy enough food for all these people. And Jesus already knows there's not that much in there. They can't possibly afford all of that. And so what's he doing? Saying you buy them something. But he didn't say you buy. He said you give. And they said we can't buy. And there's a huge difference in that. Because God isn't always asking you to buy. Sometimes God's asking you to give. And the two are very, very different. Because it's not about buying. It's really about what you would give to God. Jesus says you give them something to eat. And quit trying to get out of serving people. So prove your service by your faith now. And their first answer is I don't have enough money. He says then how much do you have? Not how much money, how much do you have as far as be giving them something to eat? And so he asked them to go and find out. They come back and the answer is we have five and two fish. And it looks impossible, right? Jesus is trying to teach something. It's one of those times where we do these things. It doesn't matter how many resources you have if you don't know how to use them. They will never be enough. It's a guy standing on a stack of ladders. If you can't see the graphic. Yeah, all of them are long enough. But that's what we keep saying is, I don't have enough. You're standing on a stack of ladders. Really? 
And sometimes it takes thinking outside the normal way in which we've done it. Faith is doing something unexpected. It's putting something to work. It's giving your faith to do something impossible along with the work that you would do. And sometimes we want to wait till we know how to pay for it all and have the money in the bank. And I'm thankful we're not worried about things like that. We're not, we've got lots of money. It's all in your pocket, but we've got <laughs> lots of money, so we're not really worried about that, okay? And yes, we should be responsible. I understand that. Don't go into huge debt or anything like that. We're not talking about that. Please don't take out loans to give to God. I just think that's sinful. I'll just say that. Don't, don't do that. I've done that, and that's just not a smart thing to do. But give what you have. And I think that's one of those important things to learn as a grace that we would be able to do. The last one is out of Acts 3. And Peter and John have started the church, and so things are going well, but man, they've got 12 guys to support, and then there's a whole lot more pre people there preaching, and then they've got all these other things going on, and so he may be correct in his assessment. It says, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he, re he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, re Nazareth rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up he stood and he began to walk and he entered the temple with them walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. This is one of those completely unexpected interruptions he has here. This is out of the ordinary. But there are some things about this. They had seen this guy before. They had seen him every single day. Because every single day he was taken, carried, and sat in front of the beautiful gate so that he might ask alms of people that are going in. And you know how that works. <laughs> As you walk in, never make eye contact. That's what we learn. We know that. Because we don't have to give if you don't make eye contact. Because then you can say, I never saw you. Sorry, I didn't even know you were there. Right? That's why it's significant that the Peter looks at him and John looks at him and he says to the man, look at us. And then he makes the great excuse. I don't have any money. Come on, Peter, really? It's the ninth hour. You know you're going to eat lunch somewhere. I don't have any money, really? There's not anything jingling in that robe that... It's not what he means, is it? And maybe we don't need to be put on the spot like that where, you know, every single nickel is somebody else's. I don't mean to say that at all. But Peter here says, I don't have any money to give you. There's a whole lot of other stuff going on. But I will give you what I have. And so giving isn't the problem. And we want to see the problem is the amount of money or somebody caught us and, oh no, there's $4 in my pocket. Because you realize if it was a 20, you'd never give it to them anyway. But it happens to be in ones. And then, oh... says a lot about us, doesn't it? I give you what I have. 
And I think maybe that's the key to the whole thing. What do you have? And sometimes we don't realize what we have. He says, get up and walk. The guy can't. So he reaches out his hand, he grabs his right hand, and he, it's then that the strength comes in the ankles and the feet, not till the pull. And he pulls him up. And everybody recognized him as the guy who was the beggar who sat by the gate that they never saw. He's not a lazy guy. Every day, he says, no, carry me to the gate and I will work my shift at the gate and I will expect people to give to me because I'm not just sitting at home playing video games thinking everybody else is going to support me. I am out doing every single thing I can possibly do. I will go to the gate. I will put in my time. I will be the beggar because it's who I am. I can't walk. I can't do anything else. I can at least do that. And Peter says, and I have something for you that's even better. What an incredible thing he gives to him as the man leaps and jumps and glory is given to God and praise is given to God because of all those things that that, well, it's just simply Peter using what he has, isn't it? How incredible is that? Just using what you have. And he happens to have that gift of healing. And he had walked by him and walked by him and walked by him and never saw, I should heal this guy, because I don't think the guy ever asked. The guy just said, do you have alms? And when he saw Peter again, he said, do you have alms? Did he not know about Jesus? You see, sometimes people don't connect. And so he's able to make that kind of a connection, that kind of a statement about this whole thing. What I have, I will give to you. And so let me just ask you today, what did God give you? There's a whole lot of things. And sometimes we think it's God in our pocket trying to take our stuff away from us. Well, as long as you didn't use God's air to do what you got. But God isn't doing that. He says, I just want you to give what I gave you. Is that simple? He's not trying to take what belongs to you. What is absolutely yours, just keep it. He's trying to say, I gave you too much. What do you have to give? And that's what God expects. He's not trying to take yours. He just says, I gave you something to share. So he gave us redemption. He gave us forgiveness. He gave us mercy. Can we share that? Seems like that would be a good thing. Is our world in need of redemption and mercy? Boy, they seem like so angry at everything. Can we give them cleansing from sin? And that's a gift. Oh, my goodness. That is a huge gift when you have somebody who's fighting you and upset at you. Can you give them forgiveness for what they did? That's huge. Just give what God gave you. And he gave you the Holy Spirit. And so give the fruit of that Holy Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Just give all those things. Since God gave to you, just give those to the rest of the world and give those to everyone else. Give, he gave you a, a love that's just beyond any other kind of love. Can you love people like that? He gave you a hope of heaven. Can you share that? He gave you grace that goes beyond all your mistakes and all your sins and all your failures. Can you give that so that it doesn't matter what kind of failures people have? You have grace for them because it was something that God gave to you and you just simply take it and share it with somebody else. God gives you blessings for you to bless others. Or maybe you're sitting there going, you know what, God hasn't given me a thing then it's time for you to repent. And it's time for you to come forward and let him bless you 
so that your sins can be taken away, so that your, can, your sins can be gone, so that God can give you grace, so that it can fill you with that spirit because there isn't a single person that God wants to turn down and say, I don't have anything for you. It's whatever you want. And God says, I give to you first so that you can give to others. Boy, if you're missing that, we want you to have a resource going out of here to be able to give. Would you come while we stand and sing?